So I want to start out this morning reading part of a story. Part of a story that may be familiar to many of us. And the story opens up this way. Many years ago, there was an emperor who was so very fond of new clothes that he spent all his money on them. He did not trouble about soldiers. He did not care to go to the theater. He only went out when he had a chance to show off his new clothes. He had a different suit for each hour of the day. Most kings could be, fa- could be found sitting in council. It was said of the emperor, he is sitting in his wardrobe. So opens the story of the emperor's new clothes. As the story continues, the emperor is approached by two men claiming to be able to weave a special fabric, something that was wonderful and that, quote, would be invisible to everyone who was unfit for, their, for the job he held or who was very simple in character, unquote. Eventually, the day came when the emperor added, uh, when the emperor paraded out in his new attire. Everyone in the crowd expressed approval for the emperor's clothes out of fear of being seen as a simpleton or unfit for their job. At last, a little child exclaimed, but the emperor has nothing at all on. What the child had said was whispered from one to another. The story continues, but he has nothing on. At last, cried out all of the people. The emperor was upset, for he knew the people were right. Since the beginning of the year, we've been in this series and the book of Revelation, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, this book opens with the phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is fundamentally about and from Jesus Christ. Chapter one gives us the picture of Jesus, who is no longer the humble, suffering servant, but... He exists now as the exalted sovereign savior. He is the one before whose feet John falls as a dead man. This same Jesus directs John to write letters to seven churches. Ephesus is the church with truth, but not love. Smyrna is a church that is poor, but rich in perseverance. Pergamum is an otherwise faithful church that tolerated faithlessness. Thyatira was a church with love, but not truth. Sardis was the church that was dead but lived under the deluded reputation of being alive. And as we saw last time, Philadelphia is the church whose faithfulness led to opportunities for service. This morning we turn our attention to the last of the seven churches The letter to Laodicea is likely the most familiar of the letters for a variety of reasons, and yet it perhaps is the most misunderstood and misinterpreted of the letters. One can make a case that this church is perhaps the most tragic of all of the churches as well. Like the story of the emperor's new clothes, Laodicea had come to focus on things that were insignificant from an eternal perspective. 
it had clothed itself, or so it thought, in greatness. However, as we will see from the text, the church had clothed itself in the world's values. And a church that clothes itself in the world's values will find that it has no clothes at all. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. And we'll take a look at this letter, the letter to Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. Jesus directs John to write these words. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you were neither hot, that you were neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray as we get into God's word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is good. We thank you that it is sufficient. We thank you that it is as applicable today as it was when these words were first put onto paper. God, we know that the only way that we can understand your words is to have our eyes opened through the power of your Holy Spirit. The only, ways, the, the only way that we can receive your words is to have our hearts opened. Lord, I pray that you would work in us. Lord, I pray that you would work in me. May these words that are spoken this morning be faithful and true to your word. Lord, we ask that you would accomplish your purposes through your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, the last of the cities located in the western part of the Roman province of Asia is Laodicea. Laodicea was located approximately 100 miles east of Ephesus near the city of Colossae, which was about 10 miles east of it, and the city of Hierapolis, which was about six miles north of Laodicea. The city was situated on a plateau that rose several hundred feet above the Lycus Valley. It was a city that was pretty defensible. It was a wealthy city perhaps the wealthiest city, certainly in the province of Asia. And much of its wealth came from banking, from the manufacture of cloth de derived from natural black wool as well as dyed wool. Additionally, Laodicea had a medical school. And this medical school was particularly noted for its study of ophthalmology. If you wanted an eye doctor, that's probably where you would, you would seek out somebody who came from Laodicea. Uh, 
the city was also known for producing a particular ice salve that was so popular that it was exported throughout the Roman Empire. The wealth of the city was so substantial that when the city was hit with an earthquake around AD 60, it actually turned down the offer from the Roman Empire to help finance their reconstruction. The city's greatest weakness, however, was that Laodicea had no natural water supply. It actually had to pipe in its water from other locations. Hierapolis to the north had these hot springs that it was known for. And Colossae to the east was known for the cool water springs that it had. And so it, have, it would have to pipe in the water to the city of Laodicea. Well, you can imagine as water travels, it doesn't maintain its original temperature. So whether it's the hot water coming from Hierapolis or the cold water coming from Laodicea, by the time it got from, uh, from Colossae, by the time it got to Laodicea, it was cold, it was tepid, it was lukewarm. And it was also so filled with minerals that it was almost undrinkable. So, um, so this was the situation in Laodicea. As we've seen with many of the churches that Jesus addresses, the church in Laodicea has taken on the identity of its surrounding culture. I don't know where the slide began away from where it originally was, but we do know that Paul addresses the church in Laodicea in his letter to the Colossians. He says, greet the brothers who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. So there had been an established healthy church at one point. But for reasons scripture does not supply, the church in Laodicea becomes something very different by the time that Jesus addresses it. This church had become nearly indistinguishable from its culture. It had clothed itself in the identity of the world. And the first thing that we see is that Christ rejects a world-clothed church. Why is this? What does the text tell us? First of all, notice that a world-clothed church possesses no spiritual benefit. Look at verses 15 and 16. Jesus says, I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, <clears throat> but because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. <clears throat> Now, the common interpretation of these two verses goes something like this. That <clears throat> Jesus rejects those who don't take a stand either way. Either you're totally committed to him or you reject him altogether. Christ tolerates no ambivalence. Now, I think there's some merit to this interpretation, we see throughout scripture a call to stand for righteousness. We see toward the end of his life, Joshua, the leader of Israel in the conquest of the promised land says, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. We see this in Joshua twenty-five fifteen. Elijah asked the people on Mount Carmel, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. We see this in 1 Kings 
Now, while Scripture does clearly challenge us not to remain ambivalent, not to remain undecided regarding our stand for or against God, I think something else is going on in this text. Jesus tells the church in Laodicea that he will spit it out or literally vomit this church out because they were neither hot nor cold. The implication here, I believe, is that if you're hot, you won't be spat out. If you're cold, you won't be spat out. So Christ retains the two. Yet we know, as we see in the rest of Revelation and elsewhere in Scripture, that God rejects those who have turned their back on him. God will judge those who turn their back on him. So if that's the case, I think there's something else going on here than you either need to be spiritually hot or spiritually cold. Those who are hot or cold, like water, provide some benefit. Cold water is refreshing on a hot day. Indeed, Jesus says in Matthew 10, 42, whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Hot water is refreshing on a cold day. I enjoy a hot cup of coffee. Generally, I don't like lukewarm coffee. And with hot water, you can clean yourself and you can clean your clothes. Both hot and cold water provide some benefit. A church that clothes itself in the ways of the world provides neither the spiritual, spiritually refreshing nor spiritually purifying benefit that it is called to be. That church has become tepid and disgusting. John MacArthur observes this, some churches make the Lord weep, others make him cry. The Laodicean church made him sick. A world-clothed church possesses no spiritual benefit. Next, we see that a world-clothed church possesses no spiritual value. Verse eight, in verse 18, Jesus notes that the Laodicean church says, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Yet Jesus goes on to say, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This was a church that had deluded, that, uh, ch this was a church as deluded and self-deceived as the church in Sardis that we saw several weeks ago. It stands in stark contrast to the church in Smyrna, which from all outward appearances was poor, but was in fact rich. This was a church that had, that had embraced the values of its culture to the point that it had no value in itself anymore. The simple thing would be to say that this represents the churches in this particular culture or that particular time in history. I've heard people say that the church in America, broadly speaking, reflects the picture of the church in Laodicea. Perhaps this is the case. Seldom in the history of the church has one nation possessed the wealth and economic power that the United States has, been, has accumulated in its brief history. The church in America has contributed to the advancement of the gospel around the world unlike almost any other nation. However, Churches in our nation have become so connected with their temporal, cultural identity that they have become almost indistinguishable from the culture around them. 
the measure of wealth of some churches is in the size and grandeur of their facilities or the size of their weekly offerings, maybe in their attendance numbers. For some, their wealth is found in political power. They sense that they are clothed with influence, the ability to sway elections and craft policies that affect the course or state, the course of their state or country. Nevertheless, churches have become impossible to distinguish from the culture because we pursue the same goals and the same, and because we pursue the same goals and we value the same things as the culture around us. By seeking the world's values, whether it be wealth, influence, or both, on the world's terms, our churches betray themselves to be of no value spiritually. World-clothed churches are no better off than the emperor walking down the street trying to convince his subjects that he is clothed in the finest and most sophisticated garments. These churches are spiritually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Such churches are despicable to Christ and deserving of utter rejection. While the church in Laodicea is perhaps the most tragic and pitiable of the seven churches, there's, for some reason, something about this church that I hold a certain amount of affection for. As miserable as its state is, this church is not beyond hope. This church is easy to criticize. I think we may, I think many of us may be tempted if we came across a church like this to walk away from it in disgust. Seeing a church in this state as a hopeless cause. But Jesus doesn't do that, does he? He's writing to a church. This is still a church that he holds in his hand. Remember, that at the end of chapter one, Jesus identifies himself as the one who holds the seven stars in his hand, the one who walks among the seven lampstands, the representation of the seven churches. Jesus has not abandoned this church. In verse 14, Jesus describes himself as the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, by expressing himself as the amen, Jesus is exerting his sovereignty. He is the one who ensures that God, that all that God has said would be, will be. He is the faithful and true witness. Jesus has not abandoned, nor will he abandon this church. He is the beginning of creation, meaning he is the source of and the power through which everything was created. Therefore, what he started, he will bring to completion. We see this at the beginning of Philippians, Philippians 1, 6. He who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. What we see in verses 18 to 20 is that Christ restores a world-clothed church. And we can see this in three ways. Three ways that Christ restores this world-clothed church. First, a world-clothed church is restored through re-examining what it values. How do we see this? Jesus has pointed out the wretched state of the Laodicean church, and then he says this, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. 
I find it fascinating that Jesus takes the very strengths of this culture and reframes those strengths to point back to himself. The problem with this church was that it was pursuing value on the world's terms. It was seeking wealth, prosperity, and health as the world would define them. The cost of purchasing these things from the world would be rejection by Christ. However, Jesus invites this church to purchase from him the things that provide for true wealth, prosperity, and health. Jesus invites them to buy gold refined by the fire. Peter speaks of enduring various trials, quote, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, seven. A world-clothed church re-examines its values by seeking a refined faith, which is the source of true riches. Jesus invites the Laodicean church next to buy white garments to cover the shame of their nakedness. This is similar to Jesus' words to the church in Sardis, which had, quote, a few people who had not soiled their garments. As with Sardis, this is a picture of purity and holiness. In contrast to the black woolen clothing that, the, that Laodicea was known for, these believers were admonished to purchase white clothes to seek righteousness and holiness on God's terms. The final way a world-clothed church re-examines its values is through what I might call corrective vision. The problem with the believers in Laodicea is that it, it is that the church often that is that it as it is, excuse me, the problem with the, believer, with the believers and Laodicea it is as it often is with the churches today is not their physical vision, but rather their spiritual vision. When we pursue our own ways and the ways of the world, we demonstrate our spiritual blindness. When we try and see things through the world's eyes, we demonstrate that. And we show our desperate need for our vision to be restored. This is the work of God, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. A world-clothed church re-examines its values by receiving an ISAV better than anything that the world can provide. It's easy to criticize the church in Laodicea. It was a church that Christ found to be revolting. However, we see something else in verse 19. The word love appears in the book of Revelation only six times in its various usages. Only six times, and one is here. Jesus says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. The church that Jesus found revolting is the church that Jesus had not given up on. He is, he is disciplining it out of love because he still cares for this church. 
Discipline properly applied never takes place in the absence of love. And so it is here. Yet, discipline itself is not what brings about restoration. A world-clothed church is restored through repentance. Jesus goes on to say to this church, therefore, in light of his loving reproof and discipline, be zealous and repent. The church had a zeal for the things of the world. Now that zeal needed to be refocused through repentance. Repentance involves acknowledging that what God says about us in his reproof is true. It entails taking a hard look at things and confessing that we have turned away from the ways of the Lord. Repentance requires a 180 degree turn, moving away from the wrong and toward the right. The church that has clothed itself in the values of the world must confess its sin and repent if it ever hopes to be restored. One of my concerns about so many of our churches, not just in the United States, but around the world, as we spend precious little time talking about repentance, either personally or corporately, but it is only through confession and repentance that a church ever has any hope of being restored. Third, a world-clothed church is restored through responding to the one who calls it. At the risk of going out, off on a rabbit trail, verse 20 in our text, is one of the most commonly misinterpreted verses in all of Scripture. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Most often this is used as an evangelistic verse. We see the image of Jesus standing outside of a house. House looking at the door and there's no handle on the outside of the door. Jesus standing there with his hands poised to knock. Waiting ever so expectantly for someone to open up their hearts and receive salvation. I've also heard this described one time as a prayer verse. Well, God can't do anything until I open the door and let him work. Neither of these is the case. This is not an evangelistic verse. This is not speaking of our salvation, nor is this speaking of prayer. What we have here is a church that is not in fellowship with Christ because of its sin of prizing the things that the world values. This is written to a church, a church that just in the previous verse has been called to be zealous and repent. The call here is for the church to heed once again Jesus' voice, to respond to his discipline, and to restore the proper relationship for which it was established. So many of our churches focus on, the, on things other than Christ. He is pushed out of our congregations because what he offers and what he requires are uncomfortable and convicting. When the church re-examines its values, when it repents of its sin, it receives something more valuable and enduring than anything the world could possibly offer. It receives intimate 
fellowship with Christ himself. Jesus says to the church that responds to his call, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. There is a warmth and welcomeness that exists in the relaxing environment of a meal that exists in few other settings. When Karen and I were up at the annual enrichment conference last week, just to get the chance to sit around and have a meal with others was so welcoming, so refreshing, so warming. And the fellowship you build over a meal is wonderful. And this is what Christ is offering to the church that repents. Far from being a passive picture of Jesus, verse 20 demonstrates Jesus to be the great initiator in this relationship with the church. He is the one calling the church to respond. He is the one offering the chance for fellowship to be restored. The question is, will the church respond? Will the church listen to its sovereign Savior and respond in repentant obedience? Christ restores the world-clothed church, but this restoration only comes through a re-examination of our values, through repentance, and by responding to the one who calls us. So what is in store for this re-clothed church? Look at verse 21. Verse 21 says, he who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What Jesus promises to the church that repents, the church that in a sense is reclothed, a church that endures, is the right to rule and reign with him in his heavenly kingdom. Paul relates an early confession of the church in 2 Timothy 2, which states, quote, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Did you catch that statement? If we endure, we will also reign with him. Revelation 5.10 says of the saints, quote, you, speaking of God, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. As I was reading this, really wrestling with how does this apply? What does this look like? What does the future look like? What does it look like when we're reigning on the earth? There's a lot that we don't know. It's interesting to me, however, that for the most criticized church of the seven, this is the church that receives this promise. Again, it's probably not what we would have expected. And God seldom does things the way that we would have expected. Even the church that has fallen so far, that is, that that church is not beyond restoration. And the reward for those who overcome is far more than what we could fathom. We don't know what this is gonna look like in eternity. We can speculate, 
but that's all it would be. But what we do know is that ruling and reigning with Christ is the reward for faithfulness. And it's amazing that this promise comes to the church that seems the most hopeless. We look at ourselves, maybe we think of our church in the same way. What's the hope for a church like ours? But God's promises are faithful and his promises are great for those who repent and are obedient. When we read the story of the emperor's new clothes, <clears throat> we find the tale of a ruler who was absorbed in himself. He invested his time and money into things that made him look better to the neglect of the things that really should have been of value to him. In doing so, he opened himself up to those who deceived him. He spent money on garments that left him naked while thinking he was fully clothed. The church in Laodicea was much the same. It had so embraced the values of the world that it was blinded to the truth that it was in fact wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The world's values are enticing. They tempt us to focus on the things that have no eternal spiritual benefit or value. Like water that is tepid, they are nauseating and sickening to Christ. The things that the world says will clothe us with worth and importance will in the end leave the church valueless and naked, like the emperor's new clothes. Jesus is calling the church to invest in things of infinitely greater value. Our churches, our riches are to be those things that we store up for eternity, precious gold refined by Christ. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our eyes are to be anointed and opened by the work of the Holy Spirit so that we may see things from God's perspective and not from the world's. Our garments are to be white the purity and holiness that God desires to clothe us with. We're reminded in 2 Corinthians that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness that we stand in is the righteousness of Christ that clothes us. When we speak of the church's new clothes, we can speak either of the way that the church clothes itself in the values of the world. Or we could speak of the church's new clothes in the white garments of the righteousness of Christ. But we need to take a warning from the church at Laodicea. The church that clothes itself in the world's values will find that it has no clothes at all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we repent, we confess that so often we seek the values of the world. We seek riches and influence, fame and notoriety as the world would define it. Perhaps as a church, perhaps as an individual, perhaps both 
yet in doing so, in pursuing the things that the world values, you find our conduct, our focus, our identity, our values to be utterly disgusting. God, I pray that you would forgive us for striving to seek the things that the world would deem as valuable. Lord, work in us, humble us. Lord, give us the wisdom to seek those things that you value, the riches that you desire us to possess, to be clothed in holiness and righteousness, to have our eyes opened by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to pursue you, the one who is of utmost value to us. God, restore us. Help us to embrace the loving discipline and reproof that you provide to us so that we might become of infinite value because we are pursuing the things that you value. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.